Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Governor Doug Burgum. Thank you for dialing in this morning. I want to thank our hosts, uh, Blake Crosby from the League of Cities and Terry Trainer from the Association of Counties uh, for hosting this today. also want to welcome Secretary of State Al Jager uh, and Tax uh, Commissioner Ryan Rauschenberger. Uh, we've had a great collaboration here at the State of North Dakota across all the agencies and across the uh, elected officials that are all working together. Uh, to serve the citizens of North Dakota through this uh, historic uh, point in our history. Uh, but I want to open uh, today with gratitude for all of you. Uh, those of you that are serving in elected positions at the city and the county level uh, play a really important role uh, in normal times uh, and now during these uh, incredible uh, historic times, uh, your roles are even more important. And, and as they, you've heard, uh, if you've watched uh, the White House press briefings uh, that they're delivering, uh, they talk about uh, six words, and that is, uh, this is a state-led, uh, locally executed, and federally supported. And at least, uh, you know, here in North Dakota, there's, you may have heard grumblings from other governors around the country, but we are in complete alignment around that idea. Uh, we don't believe it's the federal government's job to take care of, of every person in every state. Uh, we believe it's in, during a time of emergency, when we're under emergency powers, it is the responsibility of the state to lead, uh, whether that's us cutting red, red tape uh, and whether that's uh, doing whatever we can to support the counties, the cities, and the townships uh, that are out there. But when it comes down to execution, uh, we know that that's going to happen uh, locally, uh, whether that's all the way down to uh, you, you know the heroic people at a rural ambulance service in North Dakota or whether it's a nurse on the front line. Uh, whether it's uh, you know teachers and principals and superintendents in local school districts, you know building out new distance learning plans, uh, we know that the, uh, that's where the execution occurs, and we know that as part of our leadership that it's in North Dakota that it's a team effort, and we know that our job is to support uh, success at the local level. We've talked about the role of state government about is is to uh, empower people, improve lives, and inspire success. Those six words, but. We're really modifying that now. It is about empowering people, empowering people at the local level, but it's not just about improving lives, it's about saving lives. And certainly we do want to reinforce uh, success, and I know that uh, many of you are doing that at the local level uh, because it's easy for us to hear from all of our citizens the complaints, the exceptions, the, the few that aren't following the rules. But one of the great uh, opportunities that we have as leaders right now is to continue to share gratitude with the vast, vast, vast majority of North Dakotans uh, that, are, that are being conscientious, that are following the rules, and, and that there have been the guidance that have been given out, and also you know, all the essential workers uh, that are out there uh, doing the work to keep North Dakota going, uh, whether that's in energy, in agriculture, in healthcare, in education, uh, transportation, uh, you name it, we got a lot of people that are, that are putting themselves out there every day and doing that in a way, and that's business owners, business owners and their team members uh, that are out executing every day. So we, in North Dakota, as you know from the daily briefings, we're uh, well positioned and well prepared. Uh, and, and again, I would say uh, we're as, as good or better than any state in the nation in terms of how our numbers look right now, uh, in terms of our testing rate per capita, uh, remains in the top 10. Our percentage of positives, I think uh, yesterday dropped. There's only one state now that is uh, uh, below us. I forget if it's Alaska or Hawaii, but we're, we're in the best spot in terms of, of low number of positives. And we've developed a capability uh, to, to deliver uh, effectively strike teams uh, to get out and do more testing and contact tracing in hot spots, whether that's in assisted living or a nursing home or whether that's in a in a uh, you know rural community or a tribal area, and so uh, when we develop those skills, uh, yesterday we launched the Care 19 app. Uh, if you haven't heard about it, uh, if you got an Apple a smartphone, uh, go go download the Care 19 app. Uh, this is a tool that will help us uh, do contact tracing uh, now uh, during as we head towards the peak of this pandemic in North Dakota. But on the backside, it's going to be something that. Uh, with the anonymous data in aggregate, it'll help us be able to use a more targeted approach as we reopen the economy. Uh, with that, I'm going to uh, stop. Uh, and, and again, uh, whether if uh, uh, Ryan or or Al, as in.
then uh, our tax commissioner or secretary of state want to offer a few opening words, or Blake or Terry do, but we want to reserve the majority of the time for this call uh, to take questions uh, from the participants. We have uh, hundreds of people online. We've got a number of questions that have already come in. Uh, and if you want to ask questions, uh, I'm going to turn to Jace. How do people... Uh, so uh, when we get to the question time, all you have to do is press star pound six in order to uh, unmute your phone. And when you do, if we get to that, when we get to that point, uh, make sure you say your name and your city and your entity that you're representing. But uh, right now, uh, Secretary Jager, any opening comments? Uh, yes, Governor. Uh, thank you. Um, appreciate the opportunity uh, because it's a question that cities and counties will have. I uh, just want them to know that we're very busy preparing for the uh, June election. Uh, the filing date day, deadline for candidates was uh, this past Monday. Uh, I have to certify the ballot uh, within uh, several days. Uh, the ballots have to be uh, ready for uh, overseas uh, military voters by uh, April 24th. Uh, the mailing that will be going out for the uh, applications uh, for ballots uh, that's scheduled to go out on April 20th. It will go out to uh, in excess of 400,000 names. Uh, when, that, when they receive that, uh, they need to fill it out and, re, and return it uh, to their counties. Uh, that, the postage on that return to the counties is paid for, and so that is, that is covered. And then the uh, applications are are addressed uh, directly back to the county. So that's well underway, and uh, if anybody has any questions uh, going forward, be happy to answer them. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, Tax Commissioner Ryan, are you you're on the line? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you, Governor, and uh, I just want to say thank you to all the local leaders for everything you do and uh, for being on the front lines, helping keep everybody safe during these, you know, strange and, and difficult times. Um, you know, I'm on the call as a resource for you, so please feel free to, to ask any questions. I'll do my best to answer them. Um, if I if I don't have the answer directly for you now, um, I'll get our team together and we'll um, get the get the brain trust going and try to get you um, suggestions and answers as soon as possible. Just so you know, as a reminder, we've done two things in our office primarily um, um, during this uh, pandemic. Is One is extend the income tax filing deadline from April 15th to July 15th. We've also been issuing um, extensions for um, other taxes, mainly sales tax, on a case-by-case -case basis um, for an extra 30 days. Uh, we've had a, about 152 extensions that have been requested and granted. Um, so, not um, uh, so as opposed to doing some sort of broad-based extension for the whole state, we did it on a case-by-case -case basis, and we've we've really only had 152 that have uh, actually requested extensions so far. So, um, at that point, I, again, I'm here as a resource, and feel free to ask me any questions, and I'll be on the line. Um, with that, I'll turn it back to you, Governor. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Blake and then Terry. So, Governor, can you hear me? We sure can, Blake. All right, thank you so much, Governor Burgum. Again, really appreciate your time and effort and everything you're doing for the citizens of North Dakota. It's uh, We understand that uh, this is a critical time and we really appreciate your leadership in carrying us through this. I just want to add uh, my thanks to all the department heads that have been a part of the, your press conferences and these calls over the last few weeks, and also add to what Mr. Rauschenberger said, uh, the League of Cities is here as a resource for the cities that are on the call or the uh, municipal attorneys or the park districts. If you have questions as time goes on, please get those to the League we will aggregate those questions, get them to the appropriate person on the state level, and get those answers back to you. Let me also add uh, best wishes for this Easter holiday for everyone. 
Please take time to enjoy your immediate family, but do keep in mind the social distancing. Thank you again, Governor. Thanks, Blake. Terry? Yes, thank you, Governor, and thank you all that are there, and I appreciate everyone that's on the phone that uh, had the time and took the time to uh, uh, get some questions answered and, and really to express appreciation. I hope that, uh, Governor, you saw some of the messages that I sent in from counties in, in, in whole because there were a lot of comments about you, your team, and state leaders on how appreciative uh, they are with the ability to reach out and uh, get an answer and get communication back and forth. I don't know if everyone realizes how much behind the scenes work is going on back and forth, answering questions, uh, helping out, getting the assistance moving. It's really appreciated. I echo everything that um, Blake has already said, so I won't take up any more time and we can get right to the questions and, and move it along. But thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, putting this together. You're welcome, Terry and Blake, and uh, thanks to two of you for your leadership and the important roles that your associations are playing in helping us uh, stay in close communication, close coordination with all the uh, local leaders around the state. Uh, we're going to go to questions. We've got the first one in. Jace Beeler in, in uh, our office has the questions. Fire away. Jace, let us know who the question is for. Sounds great. Uh, thank you all again for being on. We're going to start with a couple of questions we received prior, and then we'll open it up to the group for questions. The first question is for Governor Burgum. What is the discussion on a stay-at-home order? Many county employees are working from home, but some cannot. So how would the stay-at-home order impact county functions? Let me uh, take this up to the national level first, then I'll bring it down to the local. Uh, over the, I'm hoping the peak of social media frenzy on this has passed, uh, but there was a lot of uh, focus as things were escalating out of control in the New York metro area, Louisiana, and other places. Uh, there was a call uh, for you know all the states to put in place now uh, the restrictions that, that uh, some other states that were in the middle of their peak uh, or still climbing towards their peak and having you know, the exponential growth uh, as opposed to the flat curves that you're seeing right now in South Dakota, Nebraska, Wyoming, uh, North Dakota, for example, uh, there was this you know call that everybody should should be doing the same thing at the same time. It's important to understand that this pandemic, as has been explained, is is there isn't just one curve for the nation. Uh, there are curves that are uh, you know going to be you know local and regional and and or statewide. Uh, and so, therefore, one of the great strengths of our country is that uh, by being 50 states, uh, you know, you don't have to, you know, shut down all movement, say, in a, uh, in a county uh, that has got, you know, no even reported cases yet. We have an opportunity to, as a state, to make pragmatic, uh, targeted decisions uh, based on the data that we have for our own state. And, and there, was, there was a lot of pressure coming at governors. Uh, some of that was really relieved on Monday night when Dr. Fauci uh, said two words. Uh, he said functionally equivalent, uh, that all the actions that states like North Dakota had taken, uh, whether it's, you know, closing schools, closing uh, certain, you know, businesses like the personal care businesses where there's a lot of close contact, uh, closing places where people, you know, aggregate uh, bars and restaurants, uh, the great uh, voluntary a collaboration we've had from faith-based organizations in terms of suspending, uh, you know, services. Uh, that again, that what we've got going on in North Dakota is functionally equivalent. I would go a step further. There are states that are out there that have put shelter-in-place orders or stay-at-home orders. Uh, that once you do that uh, as an emergency order, then you're compelled to describe if you want to enforce that. Well, who's essential and who's non-essential? And in some states, those the lists of who's Who's essential is uh, is so long uh, that the list of ex exceptions it basically you know turns the whole uh, the label of stay at home into something that's really not effective. So we're not you know it's not a competition between governors on who can get the you know the the most attractive label uh, for you know to be uh, you know to be on someone's checkbox list. What we're trying to do is to reduce what we would call you know transmissible moments. We're trying to reduce uh, the time that 
uh, people that aren't in the same living groups, uh, you know, are, are we're trying to reduce the time that they're within six feet of each other uh, for a length of time where, the, where, the, where it could, tr you know, transmit. We're also trying to reduce the amount of community contact, you know, by practicing and preaching, the, you know, the good hygiene, which means, you know, not, you know, you know, most of us were probably very good at, at washing our hands after we, you know, used uh, a restroom, but, you know, I think we've got to get better, at, you know, washing our hands after you've filled up your car with gas, uh, after you've touched the handle going into a, a grocery store, uh, you know, whether you're using an ATM, I mean, all these are services where the virus can live, and we just have to be more cognizant that if we're not practicing good hygiene, hand gene, we could be spreading uh, the virus. So with the so with, with this uh, sort of perspective of what we've got in North Dakota uh, to reduce transmissible moments by keeping physical distance and practicing good hygiene, uh, you know, right now that's working. I've said uh, multiple times and will say it again that it, under the powers that are invested in this office, uh, you know, Lieutenant Governor Brent Sanford and I, we will do uh, whatever it takes to protect the uh, the safety and health of the citizens of North Dakota, but we're only going to do it when it makes sense uh, and if it makes sense. And right now with the, the data that we have uh, coming in and one of the key pieces of data, the whole strategy of why, you know, why are we, why are we requesting some businesses to close? Why are we uh, practicing social distancing and good hand hygiene? Why are the schools closed and, we, and we're doing distance learning for, you know, the 113,000 students in K-12. Why are we doing all that? We're doing all that because if you slow the spread, you can save and preserve your hospital capacity because where you've seen the high mortality rates, uh, like in Italy, and we have, to look, we have to look at places like Italy, not China or South Korea, because we have to look at Western democracies that have uh, less tools of government to, quote, lock it down like they did in, in Wuhan in China. Uh, and more uh, the kind of controls that were pl in place in Italy or Spain. Uh, but they had, the reason they had you know, super high death rates was because they overwhelmed their hospital capacity and people that needed intensive care weren't able to get it. Uh, and so, so that's how we're saving lives is preserving hospital capacity. And as of yesterday at 3.30, uh, we had 18 beds in North Dakota out of a potential uh, already identified of 2,600. Our surge planning that we're doing that we're going to talk about later this week will surely get that number above 4,000 beds. Uh, but you know, right now we're using uh, you know, less than 1% uh, of the identified beds in the state right now. So we are at it, one of the calming things that you can deliver to the people in your county and in your cities uh, who may be living in fear and having a lot of anxiety right now, which is a real thing, and stress itself is a, is a, is a, causes uh, more health issues. Uh, whether the, you know stress can lead to eating disorders, uh, can you know uh, you know accent the issues that people have with diabetes, uh, heart condition, of course, and stroke. And so you know part of us as leaders is getting everybody to literally take a breath and calm down. And in North Dakota, you know, you, you know, you know, tune off the social media, tune off uh, some of the so-called national experts, look at the data for North Dakota. And as of today, we've got 99% of our hospital capacity still remaining. So we are in, in, in great shape. Doesn't mean we don't have time ahead of us. And when other states are gonna be on the downslope, uh, we're gonna be on the, you, you know, we might still be on the upslope when other states are on the downslope. And, and so the, the challenge, uh, again, the timing of what we're trying to do is not only when do you put these controls in, but when are we gonna be able to take them off, which is another question which I'm sure is coming. But in terms of the stay at home orders, uh, what we have asked for and received support from, from mayors and, and county leaders around the state is to just reinforce the messages that Brent and I have been delivering uh, you know, every day uh, from the state driven by, by the data that we have and making sure that we've got, if we keep compliance with what we have now, uh, then we don't need to, to actually put in uh, an actual stay at home order like other states, including Minnesota have done, uh, because is, if we can stay away from that, then we can stay away from uh, all of the battles about who's essential or who's not. And the question related to a county uh, that some jobs can't be done from home, uh, you know, as 
we've taken a look at this, you know, from a state standpoint, virtually everything the state does is an essential service. Uh, what can be done from home, we're doing from home, and we've created those accommodations. What can't be done from home, and if it's done in a, you know, a congregate setting where there's multiple people, then it's important if you've got people working together that you're providing them with masks and hand sanitizer uh, and spacing uh, or creating uh, shifts that would help. I know that one of, one of the outbreaks that we had uh, was in a, uh, a situation that was a government situation. This was a tribal government. Uh, but I would say again, there the shared learning there uh, is that you, you know don't have everybody on staff all at the same time because if you get one positive, then everybody that entire work group, uh, in this case the tribal court, you know they, you know one person turned into six people that were positive, turned into everybody had been exposed, and all of a sudden you lose that function. I know from talking to uh, Bernie Dardis, Mayor of West Fargo, and others, uh, they've taken the steps where uh, in the you know larger cities where the the folks that are in, uh, you know, the people that are doing uh, garbage collection are not commingling with the people that are in terms of the public works relative to water, uh, you know, relative to sewer, relative to city administration. So they've created, uh, normally we think, you know, silos are, are not a good thing. We continue to have to work across all those silos, but creating teams of people that don't interact with each other is a good practice because if one person becomes positive, uh, then you're not going to end up having to, you know, isolate lots of other, you know, city or county uh, em employees. And, and again, or if people are, uh, you know, if people normally all worked uh, from, you know, nine to five, another way to reduce density is to create different shift times uh, where some people might work evenings or weekends and some people work during the day so you have less people in the office and with spacing in between so they're not, uh, not all working at the same time. You know, I call all of these accommodations that we're talking about, you know, changes in what were the standard or traditional operating procedures. And again, uh, we, we that all serve in government uh, have to have an expectation. We've asked everybody in K-12 and higher education to do their jobs differently than they've ever done before. Uh, we're asking, uh, you know, we had 7,100 state employees uh, that left their buildings within 48 hours and, and set up shop and started working at home. Uh, we've taken all kinds of things that used to require, you know, in-person uh, in person inspections and some of that now is being done, you know, over Zoom or Skype or Microsoft Teams or FaceTime. Uh, so again, using technology to replace uh, what were face-to-face -face activities. So with that, I would say again, I would just, uh, in, what you're doing is essential. Figure out a way to do it safely for all of your team members. Uh, the workforce protection is one of your key responsibilities during this phase is to make sure that, that, uh, that you don't end up with a, a hot spot or an outbreak or a super spreader uh, that works for a city or a county. Uh, those are key things. And, and again, if there's things that we can do to help uh, or that our Department of Health can assist, uh, happy, to, happy to do that. But uh, for right now, again, uh, there's no stay at home executive order in North Dakota. Uh, you know, we're sticking with the same guidance we have that we're data driven and we are really calling on the sit at the citizen level, not the government level. We're counting on citizens to exercise their individual responsibility to practice the hygiene, keep physical distance. Uh, and we have backed it up with a number of executive orders, including on Monday. Everybody should know if you've got a positive in your city or community, uh, they are quarantined for 14 days as well as any resident household members that are living with that positive, whether those are college roommates uh, that are healthy, uh, if they are, uh, they don't have to stay in the same spot, but they have to stay in isolation. I mean, if somebody got sick and they had three roommates, the roommates could move out, but those three roommates uh, are also meant to be in, in isolation for the next 14 days as opposed to going to work or going to class uh, or doing what they're doing. And that's by executive order. And then also we did suspend uh, all visits to nursing homes on Monday. Uh, many nursing homes had already uh, stopped those, but we, uh, again, by executive order, eliminated those because where our real risk, uh, the real risk for this deadly disease is people over age 65 with, with, uh, with uh, multiple underlying uh, complicating factors, uh, and it's a very serious and deadly illness for them. Uh, and so again, our job here is to protect the most vulnerable. And as we've, many of you have got long-term care facilities, 
uh, in your communities and again as leaders uh, keep an eye on them making sure they've got what they need making sure that they're following the rules uh, if they need assistance uh, whether it's moving a COVID positive patient out or creating isolation uh, we need to know that we got to get alerted right away uh, we did have that happen once we had a COVID uh, positive that led to a death in one uh, one home but we got in and tested all 120 people in the home uh, we tested all 60 staff and we contained it to one death and and uh, about five other positives uh, and no other deaths other states those have turned into uh, you know clusters of deaths you know there's many incidences where seven to ten people have died in a single uh, long-term care facility and we're we are uh, working around the clock to make sure that doesn't happen here or in any of your communities. Uh, none of your communities want to become a national news story. All right, we're going to um, we're going to switch to questions on the phone for a few minutes here. Uh, so just a reminder, if you have a question, to unmute your phone. It's star pound six. State your name and which community or county you represent. This is Steve Kemp, uh, Williams County Commissioner. Hey, Steve. Uh, just a question. Uh, really appreciate the efforts uh, of the governor and, and uh, what a fantastic job you're doing. Uh, just one thing, uh, a question related to the CARE 19 app. Um, I'm getting some concerns. I've been self-promoting that on, the, uh, uh, on Facebook and, and getting some questions and concerns about being tracked. Uh, is there any advice that you can give to uh, help overcome those obstacles? Thank you. Yeah, on, first of all, I'll, I'll, uh, Jace will come up with an answer on where, where to get more information online, but uh, it, it, it's clear this information is not held by the government. Uh, the, the data is, is held on secure servers uh, controlled by uh, Tim Brookins, who's the uh, the founder and CEO of Proud Crowd, uh, which is the Bison Tracker app. Uh, so, if anybody's, you know, the 15,000 people have used the Bison Tracker app, this is actually more secure and more anonymous than that. Uh, it is when you when you sign up for the app, uh, when you when you sign up for the app, you don't have to enter your name, you don't have to enter your email address, you don't have to enter a credit card, you don't have to enter anything. It assigns you when you sign up. It signs a 36-digit complex. Uh, digital, uh, you know, digital ID number that is not traceable back to you. It's just a random. It's a random number that gets assigned, uh, and then that information uh, is held, and and then a person is in full control because they can opt into this thing. They can opt out of it. They can. There's a button where you can click where you can re re erase all of it. Uh, but most folks uh, probably have, if, if the average person's got more than 50 apps, everybody has got at least a dozen apps on their phone right now. If anybody's got Google Maps on your, on your, or, you know, on your phone right now, that's tracking your location. So this uses uh, a battery saving technique uh, in a very sophisticated algorithmic way uh, to track the data when you uh, when you stop in certain places, like if you went to a grocery store for more than 15 minutes, uh, you know it would acknowledge that. And this is not to track people; it's not to track who's positive or negative. It's to track contact tracing. So the way that we open the economy back up is with testing and with contact tracing. Testing is is the great quarterback. That's you know that's Carson Wentz. You you identify you know who the you know, you know, where you identify the opportunity, that's the target. But then you got to have someone that sort of, you know, the receiving core is the contact tracing team, and the receiving core, you know, right now we've we've dialed this up to over 250 people in North Dakota, but it's all right now super manual. So if somebody's positive, we have people that call them from our health department teams, and they say, you know, where have you been and who you've been in contact with, and a lot of people have a hard time remembering every place they've been in the last four days. Uh, all of our healthcare providers are, you know, virtually all of them 
as a practice during a pandemic practice are asking all the frontline you know nurses doctors and staff that are in their facilities to keep a manual log i mean like on paper like well who have you been in close contact with meaning who have you been within six feet of uh, for longer than you know 10 or 15 minutes in the last couple of days and what work locations have you been uh, and so the the data is anonymous it's completely secure it's protected it's not connected back to any government state or or other databases but if we find out if someone's positive then we can uh, can if, we, if someone finds out they're positive when they get a phone call from the Department of Health you know they'll ask them hey were you were you using care 19 yes okay would you be willing to share that data with us as a way to help you aid your memory and for us to know where you've been and so this is a tool to help facilitate uh, contact tracing that's the that's sort of the right now in the the in the aggregate though now we're collecting data say we got 50,000 or 100,000 people using this tool and uh, and we're we're trying to open the economy back up again and, and it's and we got bars and restaurants open and all of a sudden bang you know the virus comes back and we got you know dozens of people that are that got sick uh, and and we can't figure out that they were in contact with any particular positive uh, we could go into aggregate anonymous data and say, wow, uh, if this thing occurred, you know, in such and such a location, uh, you know, out outbreak occurred in some community, what happened? Uh, it could identify that, hey, everybody that got sick all went to the same grocery store and, and they were all there within the same period of time. And it could help us on community spread, which is something that's impossible right now for contact tracers to figure out. Contact tracers are like detectives and when the leads run out, uh, when they when they can no longer identify who a person might have been in, who been in contact with, if they got it from 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 close contact spread, then they have to assume that they got it through community, meaning they got it from through some surface where the virus was lingering. Uh, but in the aggregate, this tool could be super helpful as we try to open up the economy. But uh, this is not uh, uh, this is not China. You know, we don't have you know we don't have. There's no personal identification connected back to the individual. It's anonymous, anonymous long digit ID numbers that track location that can be shared if the people want to opt in. Information can be found more on ndresponse.gov uh, and uh, click on the CARE 19 app. Uh, and again, you can you know, download it, take a look at it, uh, and then uh, you know, you know, delete it or don't participate or if you want to look at it, but don't turn on your location tracking data. That's just like every other app. Uh, you know, there's a lot of apps say, hey, does this, you, you're, are you okay if we track your location? A lot of people say no because it burns up battery power. This was designed in a way where it's uh, very light on battery power usage, uh, but could be very useful in helping us do a targeted spread. If you, if you want to have North Dakota start opening up as opposed to having broad statewide shutdowns, this kind of data would help us uh, and, uh, immensely. Thanks for the question. This is Ian Beaton with uh, Hope City of Hope City Council. Can you hear me? I can, Ian. Go Hustlers. <laughs> right on. Um, so my question is for the E-Tabs and the gaming. Um, I'm also our gaming manager for the Hope Fire Department. Um, when we decide to, or when you decide to open the bars back up, are you allowing the gaming to open up that same day for the E-Tabs? Um, you know, with, with the fire department, we look at those donations that come in through the black tag table, the pig wheel, and the e-tabs, um, you know, to buy new equipment, to donate to our local businesses. Um, are you going to allow the gaming to open up the same day that the bars open up? No. Uh, Ryan, uh, anything you want to say about the uh, charitable gaming? I know that sits more in the uh, attorney general's uh camp than it does under tax revenue, but any comments on that? Yeah, this is Ryan. Um, I guess my assumption is that would uh, come back along as an operation within uh, within the bars. Um, I, don't, I don't see any reason why it would not. Again, as the governor said, that is all of the tax collection and regulations under the attorney general. Um, so I, I don't have a definite answer for you, but um, I don't see a reason why that would not be able to pick up at the same time. Okay. And Ian, this is uh, Doug. I, I, my answer would be the same as Ryan's. I don't. I would think they would be linked, uh, but 
we'll uh, we'll do a little more digging on that one. But when we when we we closed them, they went down at the same time. I think when we opened up, they would come back up at the same time. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. And by the way, for everybody listening, I have got tr still have trauma from losing a football game to Hope on the last play of the game uh, <clears throat> when the Irie brothers tackled me at the six-inch line and I didn't score. Uh, but I'm working to get over that. I can I can bring it back up to him. Okay. <laughs> Governor, can you hear me? Sure can. Who's this? Uh, hi, my name is Raleigh Bjornstedt. I'm the mayor at Candu. Uh, I don't have a question for you, but I've got a real concern in my area here uh, with these out-of-state fishermen coming in and working these coolies and that when the spring walleye run starts. And we're trying to be very careful around here, but it, it's, it, they just stack in here so heavy, and we're trying to – is there any way we can shut the fishing season off, like north of number two, and, and just for a month or so here till this gets over? Well, we, we've been in contact uh, with uh, uh, Terry, who runs our, uh, you know, leads our game and fish, uh, and we've been working to try to keep uh, activities uh, open that get people out of doors with the right physical separation. We've been working to do that. Uh, we did close the, the paddlefish snagging season, uh, which occurs in a pretty narrow area up there by the confluence of Yellowstone and Missouri up in the northwestern part of the state because that's another situation where everybody's shoulder to shoulder uh, stacked up along along there. The, the, uh, again, I don't know that we've got all of the, uh, the data about where, when you say out of state, but if there's, uh, we know there's a significant reduction in travel, so we would expect in everything, uh, including fishing, uh, included in tourism, just things are way down, so we would expect lower people coming. And if people are coming from northwestern Minnesota and driving across the border, uh, we have to really uh, think about that border differently because the, the people in northwestern Minnesota uh, receive their health care you know, in, at Altru and Grand Forks and in, you know, Ascension, Sanford and Fargo and people in southeastern North Dakota and Wapton, there's no hospital, the hospital's in Breckenridge. So some of these, you know, folks that are saying, hey, let's close that border doesn't really work because we've, we've, we've got a responsibility to be taking care of people in the region uh, that we're doing it. So if some of those folks are, you know, quote, out of state or coming from Crookston, uh, they're really in the same sort of I'd say healthcare management area that we're trying to manage because we've got to manage beyond uh, the state line. So that's why we're tracking cases in those Minnesota counties. Uh, we don't publish those every day at our thing, but from a from a management state management standpoint, we're looking at everybody. Uh, we're serving typically 30 percent or more of the patients at an Altru or Sanford are are Minnesotans, and a lot of the nurses, uh, you know, that work you know, in say in a Fargo live in Moorhead. So we've got to keep we got to keep at least those borders open. But if we've got out of state, meaning coming from hot spots, if you've got somebody traveling here, you know, from a New York or a Florida uh, or someplace like that, they they are uh, required now to quarantine for 14 days. So you know, under the under the you know whether it's a returning snowbird or or who it's coming, and so there there should be uh, a real drop off uh, in that. Yes, I, I understand that, Governor. But I mean, we—they come in here by the hundreds in this area, and they're, you know, Iowa, uh, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota. They, I mean, it's just—it's basically just the fishermen here for just a week to two-week period. And I just, you know, it, it's going to be a big concern. I know we had Minnesota fishermen in our grocery store here yesterday, and I—that's what concerns me. We've been quite proactive here. You know, we shut down a lot of restaurants and everything even before you ordered it just for safety and now if we're gonna have all this influx of out of state people, we don't we can't control that. I guess I don't know if there was any way just to shut just the the fishing part of it down for out of staters. Uh, like north of two and I don't know what the southern part of the state is like, but that would help us up here to stake more quarantine, if you will. Well good uh good feedback, Raleigh and we'll we'll uh include that in our discussion decision making that we have with uh with North Dakota Game and Fish because we want to be want to be thoughtful about that. Yes, and I thank you governor and you're doing a great job and uh just keep up the good work and thank you much. Thank you. 
Dr. Elton Robinson. Is, am I on here? Sure are, Bill. Yeah, I've got a question. Uh, as far as uh, the federal government kicking it down to the states, at some point are you going to consider the state kicking it down to the cities as far as making decisions on, on uh, conditions in the, in the city as far as when businesses can function and open up? Well, there, we should probably get more specific because there is on that because there's a lot of uh, things that you can do, uh, you know, right now at the city and county level that are within your powers uh, to do that. Uh, you know, our our goal has been just to stay in communication with people so that we can, uh, that we can you know, be be coordinated because we know that uh, again when you're, we know that we had a little variance, uh, you know, where you know. You know, Montana Montana shut down, I think, uh, you know, a day or something earlier, bars and restaurants, and everybody from Montana piled into Williston uh, and Beach and all those places. And so, you know, again, we've got to have uh, it's that same thing when, when we're talking about openings and closing. It's better to be coordinated. Otherwise, there's kind of a secondary set of problems that occur. But uh, we're – so if there are any specifics that – or concerns or ideas you have, we want to make sure that either we're hearing them directly or you're surfacing them up through Blake or Terry uh, so that we can stay stay coordinated in, in how we're doing this uh, response. Yeah, well, it's different. Fifty people. So, you know, I'm just wondering if we if cities can at some point make decisions on their own on, on what's going on locally. If we if we're not a hot spot, but Fargo is, do we all does, does Robinson have to shut down because there's another hot spot in the state? I'm looking for some guidance going forward. Is that is that going to be the state policy going forward? Is if if there is one hot spot in the state, is the entire state going to be shut down then? Well, the, the, again, we're, we're trying to manage this with a lighter touch than almost any other state. So when you say shut down, I, I'm not sure what that means because we're, but if it's a, in terms of the, uh, you know, our measurement, it's not really about Fargo because Fargo is, you know, is going to have the most cases because they have the most people. I mean, right now, Montreal County has got the highest per capita uh, of any uh, county. Stark County has got the second highest per capita. And so we're looking at the, per, the cases per thousand people is how we think about a hotspot, not absolute cases. But in, in Robinson, you know, again, I hopefully the you know, your local bar or cafe there is doing drive up or curbside or delivery. I know that some uh, you know cities have had local they have local control over their liquor licenses where they're selling uh, you know you know closed uh, bottles of you know beer, wine or uh, liquor, whatever they want to do, but in closed bottles that can go with a food order out the door. So there's a uh, different flexibility that's been executed there. I'm sure Blake's got examples of that. Uh, but a a again, if you said, hey, we're going to have the bar open in Robinson, uh, you know, that's uh, right now that's an infraction under the executive order. There's been some stories about that. But if it was open, uh, it wouldn't be the 50 people in Robinson that would be there. You know, you might have people driving from all over that would be like, hey, that's the only bar open in town or the bar open in the state. And so that's, again, where it could go quickly from the people that you know and trust and are in kind of your own little pod in Robinson to the same thing we just talked about with CANDU is you get a lot of people moving in from other places. So these all, every decision, you know, every action, there's a reaction. Uh, these are all complex and nuanced. And, uh, and so, again, I, I think we want to do is just keep the communication going, particularly on the, on the opening up on the backside because – there is no cure for this thing yet. There is no, uh, you know, if we avoid the peak uh, and and then we open back up, you know, back up too quickly, we can end up having the spike, you know, in the middle of the summer. I I, I, I don't want to be, uh, you know, having to shut the state down multiple times because uh, because we didn't get it right the first time. So the opening it up is going to have to be more like, you know, slowly turning the spigot on a hose versus a the way we turned it off pretty fast. Uh, but when we open it up, it's going to have to be a slower, more gradual thing, uh, so that we c so we don't end up having a a, a second hump. Any, uh, yeah, that's all understandable. But but 
if you trust the medical professionals on this, they're saying going forward un- until there's a there's a, a uh, vaccine, we're gonna have we're gonna have hot spots all over the country popping up throughout the year, and I'm just wondering if if there's a plan in place to go even if, even if it's county by county, you know, Kidder County can have bars and restaurants open because it's a very sparsely populated county, but if there's a hot spot that pops up. In Bismarck, does that mean you're going to shut the entire state down? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and I and I think that you know, given that you know, we, we you know we have more data every afternoon than we had in the morning, and the the thing that you're asking is a fantastic uh, and important strategic question. But we're going to have to make that decision after we've got to the top of this this you know peak. We're not we, we're on the roller coaster. We're still going up. We're not coming down yet, and we'll have a lot better uh, understanding of where we are, but we'll also have other states that will, ahead of us, already be on the downside because other states will already be either opening up well or opening up poorly uh, before we get there. Uh, so, so we'll have a lot of data, but stay engaged in that. And, and one thing we do, we're, we're, you know, even a month from now, there could be more widespread testing because right now all the testing is the, the swabs and the the stuff that we're doing that way. There's, you know, there are companies that are working on a finger prick blood test that you put on a, uh, you know, called lateral flow thing that would be, uh, you know, like like a simple little drop of blood on a small thing that's about like a uh, like a tongue depressor size thing uh, that would give you an instant plus or minus whether you're positive or negative. That kind of testing is what's going to get us back into the ballparks and the stadiums. Uh, and back in the factories and working. And so, you know, there's, we're not getting back to normal, we'll get back to a new normal. And the new normal is probably going to include, uh, at least for m- many people, might include masks for uh, people that are in close contact doing their work uh, for a long time. And it's going to include more widespread testing. Those are two things that are they're there. Uh, but anyway, thank you. Uh, any questions for the uh, tax commissioner or the secretary of state related to either Revenues or elections? Well, we've got those two experts on the line. So, Governor, uh, this is uh, Chad Oldman with uh, uh, the City of Butte. I'm the mayor there, and I, I was uh, going to find out how is this COVID-19 going to affect, like, the Prairie Dog Fund, and with the amount of money coming over uh, into the other buckets. I've, I I know a while back we've gotten letters for for most cities that you know had said about roughly how much money and stuff they were expecting. Uh, once certain buckets filled up to come down to your level. So I was trying to find out how is that going to affect some of the funding and stuff coming forward that, that we were looking at that. Well, the, uh, they're, not, they're, they're related but not directly related because Prairie Dog Money uh, is a bucket uh, we call, you know, it's, they have buckets that fill based on tax revenue. And of all the buckets that there are in the long list of over 20 buckets that fill up, Prairie Dog is the very last bucket. So everything else has got to fill. Uh, and then when it gets to Prairie Dog, there's actually two buckets that are there. Uh, and so the, the thing to keep an eye on is not necessarily uh, COVID, it's, it's oil prices. And so the, you know, when, we, when we're at uh, $20 oil last week for you know, WTI, and then you take the discounts for North Dakota, if it was at that level, at a sustained level, then you'd be looking at the money doesn't make it to Prairie Dog. There's nothing makes it there. You know, it's bounced back up again a little now, and we were ahead of revenue uh, for the first third of the biennium because we had eight months uh, under our belt, uh, you know, where we were running ahead. Uh, so that was that's a good thing that we're running ahead, but when you're running ahead for eight months and you got, you know, one third, one third behind you, you're running ahead, and you have two-thirds when you may be uh, running way below. Uh, you know, it's up it's 24 bucks is what the price is today, but it is... Uh, and again, I, 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 if I was trying to manage a city uh, right now, I would not be uh, building any plans or spending any of that money because I would assume that assume that the prairie dog bucket's going to be empty, and then if it's not, that'll be a gift. But I would say the conservative approach uh, would be to assume that it's not going to that, that it's not going to fill uh, just based on the oil revenues and where they're going right now. Thank you, Governor. Hi, Governor. This is Nick Parslow. I'm the mayor of the city of Leeds. Um, I was hoping you guys could touch a little bit on open meeting laws uh, with, with dealing on this. If we do get a case in our city where 
we need to have more frequent uh, pop-up meetings, uh, emergency meetings. Um, are the requirements going to stay the same with the open meeting laws or just a little bit of guidance on that? Well, that, that's, again, uh, something that we should you should keep following uh, sort of every day. We have uh, issued uh, an executive order already uh, that allows uh, for, you know, city commissions and councils uh, to hold uh, hold meetings virtually uh, that are, you know, as long as they're properly noticed and as long as the public has access to sort of either dial in or video in or whatever. But before there was, it was required that there had to be a physical location for people to go to. So we've eliminated that. So that should, that should allow you uh, to have a great deal of flexibility that you didn't have before. But again, we, we still want to preserve we want to preserve all that transparency uh, that that is there and needed in a democracy, but we want to make sure that we're not forcing local governments to do things that might endanger citizens' health, you know, by having physical locations. So that take a look at that. If that helps you get through this for now, if it doesn't, uh, we'd love to hear from the city of Leeds on on other things that we can do. But that was a direct response to uh, one of the prior calls, I and mean, it was a suggestion that came in. I think from Grand Forks, and we acted on that quickly. So again, uh, you know, Blake or others, I mean, keep keep sending us ideas where we can help you by cutting red tape. Questions for the tax commissioner or the secretary of state? Anybody got county elections or special election questions coming up? Um, Go Governor, this is uh, the tax commissioner. I had somebody text me one because they were able to unmute, if that's okay. If I can answer that, I'll address the question and then try to answer it. Super. Um, well, the question is in regards to uh, any reports or analysis um, for cities and guidelines as, as we start to see reduction in tax collection revenue, basically for their forecasting process, and I'll just address the fact that we're we're kind of all in this together, uh, the data is lagging as far as uh, when tax collections come in. So um, I'll say that May 1 it will be the first day where we really see what, for example, sales tax, which is uh, the most um, kind of indicative of where we're going on a month-by-month -month basis in the economy. Um, on May 1, that will be activity from March. Um, and also oil. So we're, we're we're kind of talking about the double whammy here, you know, oil prices being down, but also the the decreased activity in the economy could because of COVID. Um, May one will be the uh, first time we get a really good picture of what the trend line is. Um, I was just on a call with Moody's and uh, OMB Director um, Morissette, along with some others yesterday, and uh, um, we this is unprecedented because we don't really have a trend line. All the all the quarters leading up to um, really this first quarter of uh, 2020 were all positive, so all the trend lines look like we're going up, and then all of a sudden, um, the you know we until May one we don't really know what the new normal is is kind of like what the governor said what the, what the new reset is, and what our new baseline will be. So May one and June one will be the first time first times that you know we'll have one or two months of some real data to look at um but of course um as we go through the the forecasting process which has been pushed back um and I know I know Joe's under the <laughs> under the crunch uh because of that uh but um as we get more information um we'll be sure to share that with the cities because I know Kathy in our office works very closely with a lot of cities uh, passing along the, the sales tax data information and other information, and we'll be sure to let you know as soon as uh, we have numbers get put together and uh, so you can be working on your budgets as well. So um, right now we're kind of all in this together where, where we're, we're kind of in a waiting period so we can get some real data in and see what the new normal is. I'll turn it back to you, Governor. I would just say for, for those folks that have got, you know, in their communities, uh, business closures, uh, of course, because of the mandates, other people have been affected by it. I would just encourage 
uh, as you're fielding complaints is to make sure that uh, you know all the entrepreneurs, small business owners, sole proprietors, uh, people that are working at home, they all really have to dig in and understand all the new federal programs that were launched a week ago Friday. Uh, so the Week Ago Friday CARES Act passed, that's the $2.2 trillion thing that you've heard about. SBA, the SBA loan programs uh, are touching 50% of the economy. So people that are that might not think of themselves as a small business can qualify for programs that have never, never even existed before, and that would include uh, include you know somebody that might be a uh, again a sole proprietor one person LLC somebody's working at home you know building websites uh, Uber drivers Lyft drivers you know people that weren't paying into the unemployment insurance fund because they weren't working for an employer can qualify for unemployment insurance so all these questions you're getting about you know people that are saying what about me I got le you know I'm left out what about me they may not be left out but there's also in that first round of funding on the SBA loans for small businesses on that payroll protection plan, if a small business keeps their small businesses up to 500 people, so that you know, encompasses you know, about everybody but you know, 100 companies in North Dakota fit under that under 500 employee list. And if, you, uh, if you're under that list and you keep paying up to 75% of your employees, you can qualify for a forgivable loan. A forgivable loan is not a loan, it's a grant. And, and, the, and the federal government's literally giving money to companies to have them keep their people on the payroll as opposed to having them do having them on unemployment. So there's uh, tomorrow we've got a business call uh, sponsored by the Greater North Dakota Chamber uh, that is at 11 a.m. tomorrow. We'll have presentations uh, on during that call from Commerce, from SBA, and from uh, lots of other folks. They're very informed about what's going on, but the the Mnuchin on the call we had the other day, Secretary of Treasury said that over the weekend they processed $40 billion of, of requests for these SBA uh, support and they had $60 billion by Monday morning uh, in process. And so even though the number may be impressive and that it's hundreds of billions of dollars, it could literally run out. So if you've got someone who's a bar owner in your town or a small business owner or a retailer that may never in their life applied for a government program, You've got to encourage them to get, you know, in ndresponse.gov, uh, you know, that'll take you to the, the business and economic connection uh, there where the programs and learn about how these programs might be able to put uh, some dollars uh, in them to help them through this emergency. So that would be an encouragement on the, the, uh, on the economic side of things. Closing comments uh, from uh, Blake or Terry or, or Closing closing thoughts. We go to the order from anyone. Can I still ask a question? Sure. I, this is Cindy Chesley with Enderlin, and I just am questioning. You, I'd heard once about your, you know, you've done some testing in a couple different smaller cities. Is that going to be something that's going to be coming around the whole state of North Dakota, or how? What's going on with that? It was a, a test trial to try to help us get better uh, information. We had a, a moment in time where we had uh, last weekend where we identified that we had some excess testing capacity, meaning we were able to handle it all. 59 hospitals or in all other clinic locations around the state where people were getting tested. We were able to test everybody with symptoms, and we did uh, for really some of the only in the United States where we went to places where we said, we're going to do drive up and we'll test you even if you have no symptoms. Uh, we want to just get a large population uh, to do that. And one of the things that we did uncover uh, you know, from that in Slope County was we did have a, a woman uh, who had no symptoms, no cough, no fever, no whatever uh, that was, uh, was symptomatic. And we may have saved a life there because her husband was, uh, was uh, in, uh, just got done with a third cancer surgery, so it would be someone who would be fit in that vulnerable risk category. Uh, so caught it early and he tested negative and so we're in, on, they've got to stay apart for a while but uh, you know we were just trying to the models models we're trying to decide how long we have to stay shut or how long we have to do things no one's got a good gr grasp on how many people out there that are that have it that don't have symptoms and and there's very few places in the US uh, where they're 
for very few places in the U.S. like like Western North Dakota, like Slope County, where there were at the time when we made the decision to go there, there weren't any positive cases uh, or even any testing done in the whole county. So that was part of a surveillance program and that data will be shared nationally. Uh, we are now using that excess uh, testing capacity uh, to, to go to communities where there's an outbreak. So if we have an outbreak, uh, then we're gonna organize where things flare up, uh, then we're gonna send the team in very quickly uh, to do testing and contact tracing in that community as a form of containment. Uh, but as long as, you know, Enderlin, um, you know, is, you know, sort of sort of quiet on the front of no apparent outbreak, uh, then the, we would hope we wouldn't have to, uh, wouldn't have to do that. Uh, but uh, again, we got it ready. But say, if, again, if there was a, you know, the nursing home in Enderlin or the veterans home in Lisbon or something like that, if we had an outbreak, then we would use that now that we've test driven that capacity to get into a community, get there for four to six hours. Uh, we collected 368 tests at both of them, uh, coordinating with the National Guard and the Department of Health. Uh, now that we've, we've, we've learned some things about how to do that better and faster uh, for the people that were waiting in line and processing the tests, but we'll keep ramping up that skill, but uh, it's not, we won't have the capacity to test every community in North Dakota. Uh, and, and, and in part because well, we're getting ample testing here, and we're, as we've said, we're in the top 10 of states in testing per population. Uh, the excess testing supplies in this country are flowing rapidly into places like New York and New Jersey and uh, other Louisiana and Michigan, uh, where their testing rates uh, are, you know, we're, like I said, over 40% of the people they're testing in New York and New Jersey are testing positive. In North Dakota, it's 3%, so you can see why that, why we would want to resources to where we've got the biggest outbreaks but right now we're we're, we're right now we're doing great but we'll uh, hopefully we won't be an end one I guess is my answer okay thank you thank you all for joining us today uh, we've got another call scheduled next week uh, on Wednesday same time 10 a.m. Uh, in the meantime if you have questions feel free to send them to uh, Blake with the League of Cities or Terry with the Association of Counties if you need to contact our office directly, they both have my contact information. Any closing comments, Governor? No, just again, thank you all for your leadership uh, and, and uh, keep the questions coming, keep the collaboration going, and, and, and especially take care of yourselves as leaders. I know that a lot of you are used to leading from front. You know, I'm in a flood fight. You're the ones that are out there throwing sandbags and encouraging people and keeping your team and morale up, uh, but it's really important uh, that that as, as you go through this, that you also demonstrate to the public uh, the, you know, keeping physical distance, the hygiene. Uh, if you're in a, if you're in crowds, uh, again, a good idea to be uh, wearing a mask uh, to protect yourself and protect others. And so, uh, again, thank, thanks for uh, being leaders. Thanks for modeling leadership, and for you and your, you, you and all your loved ones, whether that's you're taking care of aging parents or whether you got kids that are uh, doing distance learning at home. Uh, appreciate all the many hats that all of you wear in addition to your uh, elected uh, roles. And But we need you in all those roles, you know, parents and community leaders and elected officials and every, business owners, uh, farmers, ranchers. We need you in those roles too. You're really important people to our state. So take care of yourself and stay healthy and we'll see you next Wednesday. This call has been recorded.